More now on the news that Rishi Sunak has launched a new expert group to overhaul maths teaching. Joining me now, Dr Mary Bowster, Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union. Uh, good to talk to you today, Mary. Uh, do you think there is an anti-maths mindset in schools, as the Prime Minister says? No, I don't think so. I think uh, maths is the most popular A-level subject, so uh, I think there's a very positive maths mindset in schools. Uh, I don't really know where he's got that uh, view from, really. The evidence doesn't support it. Well, Downing Street says that a third of pupils fail their maths GCSE, and the Education Secretary says it's, it's not that people aren't able to understand maths, it's the teaching that's lacking. Well, the um, government's been in charge of the maths curriculum now since 2012. Um, actually, a third of children fail because that's baked into the algorithm. Every year, there's a norm reference curve which shows how many children should get a level nine to down, how many should get a level one. Um, so actually, the fact that a third of children fail maths and English every year, no matter what standard they achieve, and no matter if, if one year the standard is much better than another year, that's baked into a norm reference curve. If the government wants to stop that, they should have a, a level, a, a standard by which you get a certain grade, and all the pupils who get that grade actually get, you know, who reach the standard actually get the grade, rather than factoring in a third failing every year because that's something that is a result of the government's own policies. It's not a result of the standards that pupils achieve. Far too, pe far too few people actually know that, and I'm surprised Rishi Sunak doesn't. Mm. Um, he says, though, it says that, that there's this cultural sense that perhaps children who are not good at maths, there's just an acceptance of it. Well, I'd really like to know the evidence that the Prime Minister has for that statement. I think it's a bit, it's a, it's a real shame that this is being um, uh, put forward as though um, teachers aren't really trying to do their best. I mean, the problem we have more than anything else in schools, and probably the reason why uh, children aren't getting the maths education they deserve, is because we've got a chronic shortage of maths teachers. Uh, the government's reduced its target for maths teachers twice since 2020. And uh, even last year, even with the reduced target, they missed the target by 10%. The, the fact is that teachers are doing their very, very best with a shortage of teachers and particularly a shortage of maths teachers. And that's the result of the teacher crisis we have in our schools where the government missed its secondary training targets by over 40% this year. So schools are doing their very best. They can't recruit maths teachers. Many teachers are teaching out of their subject area. And within that, uh, we've got maths as the most popular A-level. I don't think it's a problem about quality of teaching. I think there's an issue about the number of teachers available to teach maths. And if we can't get enough teachers to teach maths up till 16, then how on earth are we going to get them to get enough maths teachers to teach all pupils till 18. I think I think the Prime Minister's ambition is a laudable one. I think our curriculum narrows too much after 16. But you can't just will the ends. You've got to provide the means, and the government's failed to do that repeatedly. The Education Secretary has pointed out to bursaries and levelling up payments for those who want to come into the profession, especially to teach maths. Why do you think that that isn't encouraging people to come in and apply for jobs? Um, because I think that... Um, Graduates, well, first of all, we're in a really competitive graduate market. They can, um, graduates can have a whole range of jobs which they can apply for and get. Uh, secondly, I think even with the bursaries that teacher pay is unattractive uh, and, you know, has declined more than any other graduate profession since 2010, a 13% decline if you count by uh, CPI inflation. And the third reason is workload. I mean, many graduate jobs now you can work flexibly, um, but you're looking at a profession which the government's own workload report last week shows teachers, well, two weeks ago, teachers and leaders routinely working 55, 60 hour weeks. So, um, you know, the government has to create the conditions by which teaching becomes a more attractive profession if you're going to get graduates to enter it, particularly graduates with degrees which are very, very valuable in all sectors of the economy, maths degrees. And you talked about so many teachers having to teach outside their subjects. I mean, do you think there is a case that, that there needs to be greater teaching for teachers, that those who are teaching pupils maths need to have further training themselves before they actually start doing it? Well, I think that um, 
I, I keep, you, you keep coming back to a quality of teaching. I mean, certainly if you're teaching out of your subject area, yes, you do need extra training and significant extra training to be able to do that confidently because confidence in your subject knowledge is really important. But so many schools have half their maths departments filled. Uh, in so many classes, children are being taught by cover teachers who are doing the best job they can, but they're not maths specialists. So many maths classes are being taught by teachers who are not maths specialists because the government can't recruit enough teachers and particularly enough teachers in STEM subjects, although there are teacher shortages throughout the secondary curriculum. So if we're going to really tackle the issue of teaching all young people maths till they're 18, we really have to tackle those teacher recruitment and retention crises uh, across the curriculum. And if you're focusing on maths, absolutely in maths. Uh, and finally, before we let you go, the, the strikes that are still scheduled to take place, public support is still high for, for teachers and, and their strikes. Are you concerned, though, that it could drop off once we get into the exam period and people might feel that their children's exam chances are actually being affected? Well, we've, uh, we've got two days of strike action next week and the week after, and we've issued exemptions for Year 11 and Year 13 pupils, which means that they can they will be you know, staying in school and revising and learning. And we've got no exams planned during the um, exam period. And all that has been deliberately done in order to protect the life chances and the exam preparation of those pupils. But I have to say again, we don't want to be striking. We would, we want to be in negotiations. My members, the National Education Union members, rejected the government's pay offer by 98%. 98% of members who voted rejected it. So that's a very strong rejection. The government needs to come back to the table, reopen negotiations, and let's see if we can get a serious offer which addresses not only the cost of living crisis this year, but the long-term decline in teacher pay. And if we can do that, there's no need for these strikes. We're ready, we're willing, we're able to negotiate at any time. And we asked the Secretary of State, we have written to her, asking her to reopen negotiations. Let's hope she does so. She says it's up to the independent pay body. Why do you think that that isn't the best forum to reach a negotiation? Well, because it's not independent. The government appoints the, um, the, the uh, appointees to the um, pay review body. The, the government says to the pay review body, we consider this amount affordable. So we consider, they've said this year, a 3.5% uh, limit with a, a, a better offer for beginning teachers, but for experienced teachers, three and a half percent. You know, the government has all the control. And then the, even the, if the SDRB, the pay review body, has a makes a better, you know, makes a better recommendation, the government can decide whether or not to accept it. So the, the pay review body isn't independent in any sense that I, or perhaps you, understand the meaning of the word, and I'm an English teacher, um, understand the meaning of the word independence. It's not independent at all. And it's not the pay review body's negotiation to resolve a dispute. Government ministers and the government have to take responsibility to do that. They've created this dispute by the way they've treated teachers over the past 12 years, by the way they've funded education over the past 12 years. They have to take responsibility for that, and they have to take the leadership to start to put it right. And just saying well, we'll leave it to the pay review body. That's an abdication of leadership, an abdication of responsibility. Dr Mary Bastard, uh, Joint General Secretary of the NEU. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.